Since 1939, he is passing into history and looking back upon what I have experienced during this year, it is only natural for me to send a special thanks and hearty greetings from the Crown Princess and myself to those of our countrymen abroad and to those who still count themselves closely related to uh, this country by ties of sympathy and of blood, whom we had the great pleasure to meet last summer in the United States. Never before have I conceived so clearly that our countrymen abroad mean for the mother country. And never before have I seen so vividly that the country may continue to draw strength and grow outside her own borders. We are sincere thanks for the wonderful memories our meeting with you all last summer has given us. We, the Crown Princess and I, send the people of the weakened birth of religion in the United States our best wishes for the new year. And at the same time, I take this opportunity to send the same good wishes to all our friends and friends of Norway whom we have the pleasure of meeting during our visit in the United States. This is send me to all the Norske, Jutland and Persoon, to Vejne, Aslik, venner og bekjente, og på vegne av hele det norske folk, de hjerteste ønsker for den de gjorde. Today in Europe. At this time, the Columbia Broadcasting System brings you the latest foreign news direct from important European war capitals. Tonight, we shall attempt to bring the news from Amsterdam and from Helsinki. Edward R. Morrow, chief of the Columbia European staff, has just arrived in Amsterdam to talk with William L. Schara, CBS Continental Representative. And so we take you now to Amsterdam. You know, that's a nice story, Bill, but I just don't believe it. You're no, not. No. You're not, sir. I'm not going. In peacetime, we used to fly from Berlin to Amsterdam in a couple of hours. Now you take the train. It takes 13 hours. And the trains are late and cold. But well, you flew over, didn't you? I think so. It was more like being swung around in a barrel at the end of a long rope than flying. That plane was painted bright orange and all the windows were blacked out. Why would they black the windows out? Oh, just so curious reporters can't see anything while flying over England and the Channel. How long did it take from London to Amsterdam? Do you mean flying time or total time? No, all together. Well, I left London at 7 in the morning. Traveled on a cold train to a little place you're not supposed to know about. Uh-huh. Spent about uh, three hours doing things with little bits of paper and books and got to Amsterdam about half past three in the afternoon. It's not so simple getting all these countries, is it? So, Bill, six months ago, I could have traveled around the world with fewer papers and documents than were required for this trip. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I thought the place where I worked had a monopoly on that sort of thing. Well, you see, they haven't. You know, Bill, this conversation isn't going very well. Maybe it's because we both want to talk about the same thing. Ed, I want to talk to you about the lights I saw last night in this town. All right, go ahead and get it over with. You've got no idea what it's like to get into a city and see the streets all lighted up. What do you mean? I've got no idea. I saw street lights, automobiles with real headlights, and light pouring out of the windows tonight for the first time in five months. It's a shock. Seems almost indecent to have all this light about. And as soon as we finish here, I'm going out and look at those lights again. Maybe you think I'm not, too. You know, Ed, it sounds terribly to say so, but when I got in last night and emerged from the station and saw all those lights, I dropped my bags in the snow and wandered about the streets for half an hour, just looking at the lights. I kept studying the position of every lamppost and fire hydrant, making a mental note of their location so I wouldn't run into them if the blackout comes. Well, let's hope it doesn't come. Right now, Holland seems to me just about the nicest country in Europe. There's light, heat, and don't forget food and coffee and oranges. It's been snowing all day. People have been skating on the canals, and everybody's as calm, courteous, and considerate as ever. Just taking a quick look at this country, you'd hardly know there was a war on. Like in Switzerland, you'd see quite a few soldiers in the station, but that's about all. I'd like to forget there's a war on for a few days, but I suppose since this is the first time we've been together since the war started, we'd better compare a few notes. Remembering three things. First, that we're talking from a neutral country. Second, that you've got to go back to Berlin. And third, I've got to go back to London. The question most people are asking in England these days is, will the Germans attack in the spring? 
And then I don't know a single German who isn't sure that there will be plenty of action in the spring. But what kind it'll be and where, no one knows or is likely to know until the blow falls. Oh, I see. Does that mean that uh, the Germans have pretty well given up hope for the success of the so-called peace offensive? Absolutely. You'll hear no more talk of peace in Berlin. As Dr. Frick, the German Minister of Interior, told the people last Sunday, the decision now must come by force of arms. And the German people are reconciled to it. Well, when you say action in the spring, you mean a general offensive? Not exactly. Dr. Frick promised the people the other day that no lies would be thrown away in this war. Most people took that to mean that there would be no large-scale offensive against the Maginot Line, which would be a very costly proceeding. In Germany, when people talk of action in the spring, they seem to have in mind something else. Say, a great air offensive directed against the country where you're stationed. Mm. Of course, the truth is, when you come right down to it, uh, German generals, like British and French generals, are not giving away their plans in advance. Therefore, whatever happens is likely to be in the nature of a surprise, but that something will happen and so on, every last person in Germany is sure. Well, Ed, what sort of action, if any, do the people on your side expect as soon as the snow melts? So we get a new theory every 24 hours. But on the whole, the British think they're doing pretty well with things up to the line. You mean they expect the war to continue as it has for the next few years because the Germans don't? Well, put it this way. The British think their blockade is squeezing the Germans pretty hard. We are losing many men. They're trying to equal Germany's rate of airplane production. And a considerable number of people have some sort of vague idea that if they just keep the pressure on the Germans, the Germans will finally crack without any major military action. The real difficulty, of course, as you from London, is that there just isn't any front. You can almost say that it's a war in search of a front. Well, as it looks from London, the Germans still have the initiative, and they can take whatever front they like from that move you seem to expect in the spring. Well, that's interesting because the Germans think that the Allies have already taken the initiative and they're quest for new fronts, say, in Scandinavia or in southwest Europe and both places. Strategically, it's to the advantage of the Germans to keep that front as small as possible. And, of course, if it's to be widened, to pick the new front themselves. Yes, I see. Of course, uh, the British are looking about for new fronts, but the map's all covered up with neutrals. And the British assert that they don't propose to violate anybody's neutrality. Well, of course, there's always the possibility that some of you may invite them to come in to prevent the house from being robbed. Here's a question I'd like to put to you, Ed. Is there any talk in your country of a possibility of a negotiated peace before the, really, the war really gets serious? Plenty. You see, the official British position is this. They say they're going to negotiate a peace at the end of this war, even if they have to beat the Germans first. Of course, those ideas may change when the time comes to make the peace. For the time being... British propaganda is trying to convince the Germans that they can have a reasonable peace if they'll only get rid of their present rulers. In all frankness, I must say, I don't think that propaganda is getting very far in Germany. The average German you talk to, regardless of whether he's a supporter of the regime or not, will tell you that he remembers very well the Allied propaganda in 1917-1918, in which America also had a part, and which promised him that if only he would get rid of the Kaiser, the German people would be given a just peace. Somehow this Allied talk about getting rid of the present regime and then getting a fair peace strikes him as no more sincere than the similar propaganda in the last war. I see. Does that mean the Germans take the view that it's uh, all or nothing, that they've got to win this war or be smashed completely? Exactly. Every day it's hammered into them that they have only two alternatives, either to win the war, in which case they have a bright future, or to lose the war, in which case their present leaders assure them that there will be such a peace as will make Versailles look like an ideal instrument of justice and fair dealing. Don't underestimate the sacrifices almost any German will make in order to avoid another Versailles or worse. And I'm very much afraid that on that particular point, the German leaders are right. As you know, there's a lot of discussion in London of liberal peace terms for an equal and self-respecting Germany. During the early months, the distinction was constantly drawn between the German government and the German people. I remember reading those yeah. Well, that's changing. People are beginning to get mad. This bombing and machine gunning of trawlers hasn't helped. And don't forget that the French have their ideas about what's to be done with Germany when and if the Allies win this war. From where we here in London, those ideas are put into practice would pretty well pulverize Germany and probably pave the way for another war. Not in 20 years' time, then in 40. Uh -huh. There isn't quite as much talk of a federated Europe after this war as there was during the first few months. There's more talk of a complete union between Britain and France. 
I think maybe we agree, Bill, that whoever wins this war is going to impose a peace that will make Versailles and Brest Litovsk look like a polite exchange between friends. Well, that's one thing we do agree on, Ed. All right, let's talk about more pleasant things. About food? <laughs> All right, about food and drink. First, let's record the fact that the food in Amsterdam is excellent. A grade, especially the oysters and butter and coffee and oranges. What about the food in Germany? You look pretty well fed. You know advertisements for the British diet yourself. Well, that's not the fault of the control of food, Bill. There's still plenty of everything to eat and drink in London, except uh, bacon, butter, sugar, and ham. What about Berlin? I don't do so badly myself. You know, Africa's maybe, but in Berlin, for some reason, they classify me as a heavy laborer. <laughs> I'm laughing, all right. It's no joke, Ed, because... It means that as a heavy laborer, I get double rations. On top of that, we foreigners are allowed to import a little butter, a few eggs, and some bacon from Denmark. Naturally, we're better off than the German people. But it's wrong to think the German people are starving. They're getting enough to eat. And personally, I don't find it a very balanced diet, if you get what I mean. Uh, I do. How's the beer? Good. It's a little weaker than in peacetime, but it tastes all right. The thing in this most in Berlin is good coffee. I see. Uh, what about the theater in Germany now? Well, they're all open and they're all full. The war has brought them across that they never know in peacetime. What are they playing? You probably won't believe me, Ed, but the most popular play now out in Berlin is by a British author. A British author? He's been talking to men since the war started, and his name is uh, George Bernard Shaw. The play is Pygmalion. When I get back to London, I shall ask Mr. Shaw if he's betting his royalties on those performances. I'd like to know. Uh, how about the theater in London, Ed? Well, they were all closed during the first few weeks. But most of them are open again now. And they're doing pretty fair business. Most of the stuff is light. And the audiences are certainly not very critical. Incidentally, dozens and dozens of new bottle clubs, a sort of combination nightclub and speakeasy, have opened in London during the past two months. Well, I must say that uh, we can't go stand here in Berlin. Uh, rather than in Berlin. All the regular night clubs are open and doing well, but they have to close at 1 a.m. What's the most popular song in Berlin now? A little piece written soon after the outbreak of the war called We March Against England. It's a very catchy tone. The sentiment is popular, and everybody's singing it. Any popular war songs over there? Well, um, the best effort so far is a tune called uh, We're Going to Hang Out the Washing on the Siegfried Vine. Another popular tune has a strong Teutonic flavor. You may remember, Bill, it was popular in Prague when you were there during Czech prices. It's called, I think, uh, the Beer Barrel Polka. Remember? Oh, yes, I remember. But the messenger boys in London, and a lot of other people as well, are whistling and humming Franklin D. Roosevelt Jones. That's probably the most popular song in England today. <laughs> um... You did all uh, the women wearing uniforms in Germany? Only the labor service girls, but they were in uniform in peacetime. Why? Are the women wearing uniforms in England? Oh, plenty of them, but not too successfully. One of the big newspapers took a poll the other day asking Englishmen to state their pet peeve or grouse. Mm -hmm. Women in uniform led the list by miles. Well, I, I can't say we have that problem in Germany, but there's another, and that's clothes in general. The Germans, men and women, get only 100 points of clothing per year. And if you're a woman and buy say, four pairs of stockings and one or two other odds and ends, you have many points left over for new dresses. That, I suppose, would create a problem, but I'm no expert, and I guess we just believe that. Are you having much trouble with the censors these days? Well, we haven't come to blows yet. They're really not bad fellows. Of course, they have an unfortunate job. The worst thing is not the actual censorship, but the censorship of news at its source. Well, that's pretty much the same thing in England. The greatest example of that, of course, was... Uh... The news we didn't get and still haven't got about the uh, resignation of Mr. Ovalisha. Uh, um, well, Bill, let's go out and throw snowballs. You have been listening to another Columbia broadcast of Today in Europe. We regret that contact with Helsinki between Mr. Herbert Hoover, president of the Finnish Relief Fund in New York, and his representative, S. Dorsey Stevens in Helsinki, was impossible tonight because of weak signals and interference. This is the Columbia broadcast.